If you you watch the the guy, we also need to recognize that. series never get past, past the development or pilot phase. For all of these projects, if we go on a royalty basis, authors and performers will never actually receive any royalty share and will be severely disadvantaged by the imposition of a royalty. Even if these are produced, few films and TV series are a financial success. And therefore, in those circumstances, there's a very strong likelihood that a royalty payment would be very low or even negligible. Now let's talk about a good case scenario where the film is successful or the TV series is successful. It takes time to reach financial success, a considerable amount of time to do so. Royalty share payments will be far in the future for these creators and performers. This too might cause undue financial hardship to authors and performers. An equitable upfront payment removes the risk and time delay for authors and performers who depend on these payments for their livelihoods. As we understand it, the bill speaks to the royalties to be paid to performers and authors being based on gross profits and not net profits. We've already spoken about the significant Upfront, upfront financial investment that is necessary to put a production in place, right? It's only fair that these people who put in all this investment, raise all this money to fund a production and bear the risk of it never actually going into production, of it never being a financial success, to be able to recoup that investment and to hopefully be able to make a, um, a, a, a profit on those projects. Therefore, even if a royalty is to be calculated, it would therefore make sense for a royalty to be calculated on net profits, that is after costs have been paid, rather than for it to be calculated on gross profits. Otherwise, it just does not make sense for the investment to be made. Another point that is important to, to highlight is that it's very difficult to determine and define a profit with respect to subscription services. I'm sure many of you honorable members are like me where increasingly we're moving across to um, using streaming services and subscription services where we can watch our shows on demand. Um, where we have streaming services that are subscription based, unlike broadcasters, we don't have direct revenue attributable to any specific film or TV series. So being able to calculate royalties of those profits becomes very challenging. Finally, we note there's a difference in approach between the copyright bill and the performance bill. So the copyright bill says that the royalty uh, requires that we have royalties, while the performance bill says that we should have royalties or equitable remuneration. We suggest that this inconsistency should be addressed and I think other um, other presenters have also suggested the same. Um, I'd like to turn to Anne to speak on the international approach, please. Thank you, Wendy. The proposed changes to the Copyright Amendment Bill regarding unwaverable royalty payments with respect to each copyright assignment is simply not in line with global industry norms and approaches to the remuneration of authors and performers. And please note, Honorable Committee, that when we give examples of other countries' laws, we're not advocating that South Africa should adopt such laws. We just want the committee to understand that there are different approaches than those set out in the bills to, to achieve the similar objectives. 
So in practice, copyright in literary works or audiovisual works are usually assigned or licensed from authors and performers to producers, and such authors and performers are remunerated by way of an equitable upfront payment. Other presenters have suggested that royalties are standard, but this just is not our experience globally. The UK and Canada's copyright laws, for example, offer protection to authors and performers by requiring that they be paid an equitable remuneration for their copyright works. However, it's important to note that the payment isn't limited to a royalty share, nor is there a perpetual obligation that attaches every assignment of an author's or performer's copyright work. And now turning to the EU, the EU Copyright Directive of 2019 requires that authors and performers receive appropriate and proportionate remuneration. However, it also gives member states the liberty to use different mechanisms and take into account the principle of contractual freedom and a fair balance of rights and interests. And regarding the Beijing Treaty, the payment of a perpetual royalty is also um, not a concept required in international treaties. Others have spoken about South Africa's obligations under the Beijing Treaty. We want to re-emphasize that the Beijing Treaty allows for a performer to receive royalties or equitable remuneration. The Beijing Treaty is not restrictive, nor is it prescriptive in the manner in which royalties should be paid. The only requirement is that remuneration must be equitable. This means that an upfront lump sum payment to performers is more than acceptable. Therefore, the Performers Bill is aligned with the Beijing Treaty, but the Copyright Bill is not. Back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Anne. In all, we advocate that the Copyright Bill and the Performers Bill be revised to give authors, performers, and copyright owners the required flexibility and independence to determine their own contractual arrangements in respect of remuneration and to be free to select an appropriate remuneration model that best fits the commercial realities of the applicable production and their personal financial needs. Further, we advocate for revisions that allow producers, authors, and performers to be free to determine the manner and form of their commercial arrangements as a standard globally. I'd like to turn to the second major point, which is the registration and reporting requirements as set out in the bill. Section 8A5 of the Copyright Amendment Bill provides that any person who executes an act um, as contemplated in section eight for commercial purposes must register that act in the prescribed manner and form an, and submit a complete true and accurate report to the performer, copyright owner, indigenous community or collecting society in the prescribed manner for the purposes of calculating the royalties that are payable to the author and performer. Now, how we understand this in the ambit of the entire um, uh, amendment is that we want to make sure that the people who are entitled to remuneration get the remuneration that they're entitled to. Does it achieve this effect is the question. Firstly, the registration and reporting requirements are really onerous, administratively burdensome, and practically impossible to achieve particularly considering how frequently copyrighted works in practice are assigned from authors and performers to producers and then from producers to their affiliates and, and sub-distributors. Further, any intentional failure to comply with this section results in the imposition of a criminal sanction. In the case of a company, that criminal sanction is a fine of a minimum of 10% of the company's annual turnover. This is an excessively steep fine and scares away investment as it puts too much at risk for a relatively minor compliance issue. If we look at the purpose of why this provision is in there, the point of registration is to be able to allow for the monitoring and calculation of royalty fees based on the success of the film or television series, right? So the registration should at least be limited to actions that generate revenue. We also need to think about the practicalities of this. In our case, we would be required to register and report on all instances of the prescribed act, which includes every act of reproducing, communicating to the public, distributing, and, and such like. This could amount to hundreds of thousands of acts for each film or TV show. 
we would be required to take each of these hundreds of acts, attach those acts to an author or a performer, and then subsequently register and report on these acts. On a single film or tens is required, nor were failure be criminal. Very few countries have a copyright registration system at all. And when they do, it's usually voluntary or limited to the work itself. The copyright laws in the United States, for example, do provide for the registration of copyright commercial transactions, but the purpose of such a registration is to provide notice and benefits to the copyright owners. Regardless, registration is not mandatory. And other presenters have compared these reporting issues to the music industry. However, we want to note that in the music industry, the obligation to track music performances is imposed on the collecting societies and not on the producer or copyright owner. In order for authors and performers to effectively receive regular payment and reporting of a royalty, a fully functioning collecting society structure has to be in place, both nationally and internationally. And while such a structure is in place for music performances, there is no such structure in place either nationally or internationally for audiovisual works. And we're not aware of any movement internationally to have such a system in place. So now I'll turn it over to Lindy to talk about the third major area of concern, reversion. Thanks, Anne. So we know that section 22.3 of the Copyright Act and section 3A.3C of the Performance Bill proposed to limit the validity of assignments of copyright in literary works, musical works, sound recordings, and performances in audiovisual works by performers to a period of 25 years from the date of assignment. The effect of this is that in practice, any copyright in such works will revert back to the authors and performers upon the expiry of 25 years from the date of assignment. Now, this one is really close to me, if you think about who we are and how we operate as African societies. We are a people with an oral tradition. It's how we tell our stories. It's how we tell our histories. It's how our knowledge is passed down by telling stories. The effects of these provisions would be to stop stories being told. In light of the fact that every film or TV series is made up of multiple copyright works, literary works in the form of screenplays or scripts, the film itself, musical works, the individual performances of actors. All of these works are essential components to what constitutes the whole film or TV series. It's for this very reason that assignments of copyright in these works are essential to the commercialization of a film or TV series as they all enable the individual elements to be bundled into a single package, which can then be distributed by the copyright owner or licensed by the copyright owner to third parties, where each of these individual elements reverts to the performers or to the authors after the lapse of 25 years, the individual components are scattered and no longer capable of commercialization. After 25 years, those stories can no longer be told. As an example, if the performance of an individual actor, let me fancy myself as an actor. If the performance of Lindy Wundler reverts to me, then my performance must be removed from the film or TV series, therefore making it impossible for that film or TV series to be commercialized after 25 years. The end of this commercialization is to the detriment of all authors and performers who are part of that TV series it can no longer be shown. And over to you. Unfortunately, this proposed reversion right is not aligned with international approaches, and it likely makes South Africa have the world's shortest copyright term for film and TV. In most countries, copyright extends for many years, even after the death of an author, often 70 years after death, such as is the case in Nigeria. Very few countries have any right of reversion or termination for authors. Further, we're not aware of any country where rights revert to performers after a period of time. In Canada, for example, ownership of copyright in an existing work will automatically revert to the author's estate at the end of 25 years after the author's death and only if the existing work was assigned. 
It should be noted, however, that the reversion right explicitly excludes collective works, which Canadian courts have found motion pictures to be. Another approach is a, another example is the approach used in the United States, which differs from the Canadian approach. In order for copyright to revert, U.S. authors or their estates must take active state steps to reclaim their assignment copyright via the delivery of a termination notice. And this notice has to be delivered during a very specific window of time following 35 years from the original grant date. There's no automatic right. We wanna also note that the termination right used in the US expressly excludes works made for hire, which again, film and television series fall under when they're first made. Therefore, we believe that South Africa would be alone in the world in having a copyright reversion or termination that applies to film and TV series. Over to you, Lindy. The final point that you'd like to raise, which sort of has impact across all of the points we've raised previously, is the extraterritorial impact or effects of this of the, of the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, as mentioned previously, Section 3.1 of the Copyright Act provides that a copyright will be conferred on every work that is conferred, that is created by any person that is a South African citizen or is domiciled or resident in the Republic. Without the proposed changes in the Copyright Amendment Bill, we understand that the intent and purpose behind this section originally. However, the changes in the Copyright Bill discussed today would theoretically be applied beyond the borders of South Africa and impact on the international sovereignty of other countries' copyright laws. Just to emphasize, we do not intend to debate the legal validity of such extraterritorial uh, applicability, but we want to highlight the concerns that it might cause if it were to apply. So there would be different rules just for South Africans, for instance. If the proposed changes were to apply, they would apply to any author or performer who is a South African citizen or resident, even if that person is living and working outside of South Africa. This could mean that if a producer hires South Africans to write or cast South Africans in international productions, then all of the concerns previously discussed today would apply to such a producer's international film or TV series. As we've previously talked about, the bills are not aligned with global norms. So different rules and norms would have to be applied only to the South Africans attached to such film or TV series. Typically what happens is that the law of where the production is happening is what would apply. So look at reversion, for instance. If we look at the effects of reversion as we've just discussed now, this could result in an international producer or distributor losing the ability to commercialize their film or TV series after just 25 years. If just one South African author or performer does not renew their copyright or is unable to do so. We all know that there are many South Africans who have made their names outside of South Africa. They're flying the flag very high. And I, for one, am very proud of them. But the extraterritorial impact of this might have the impact of deterring international producers and studios from engaging the services of South African authors and performers in their productions in order to avoid the effects of the prescribed reversion rights and the royalty and the registration requirements. Producers and studios can hire talent from any other country without losing rights or being forced to pay a royalty or having to comply with onerous registration requirements. Entire projects could be jeopardized by one South African performer or author. As a result, South African authors and performers will struggle to land work or roles outside of South Africa. As you're aware, many South African writers and performers have made their names internationally and these proposed changes would severely limit international job market for South African authors and performers going forward, especially for up and coming talent. We are very, very sure that this was not the aim and likely an oversight, but it will have an intended consequences to the disadvantage of South African authors and performers worldwide. Just to wrap up, um, we are very grateful for the opportunity for Amazon to share its thoughts on these bills. We hope to continue to engage and share some of our experience and knowledge with the panel and with the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee to continue to empower all South African creators to create future-proof, skilled jobs, to bring local stories to global audiences and to impact adjacent industries. 
With the above in mind, we do not believe that at this stage, these bills are ready to pass as they do not create the pr protections for the creators and performers as envisioned. And at the same time, our sense is that they will erode the very copyright laws that are meant to protect creators and performers. We are very concerned that these will have negative economic impact, will deter innovation and creativity within the industry and disincentivize inward investment. We're especially concerned for the next generation of South African talent, future creators and performers who, due to unintended impacts of the bills, might be constrained from sharing their talents with both local and global audiences. We emphasize the economic growth of this industry in South Africa, where one rand of expenditure has generated an additional two rand 82 of additional income in the wider economy. Given the industry's significant economic contribution to the country, we would like to suggest that an economic impact assessment is carried out to quantify the current industry in South Africa, covering direct spend, jobs created, and other benefits, and to identify what would be negatively impacted if these bills pass in their current form. We believe that there are alternative solutions to protecting authors, performers, and creators. We hope to work with the committee to achieve this important mission of safeguarding South African copyright law, whilst also ensuring a sustainable, secure future for South African creators. Honorable Chairperson, honorable members of the Select Committee, we thank you for your time and consideration, and we welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahunda and Mrs. Ann for the comprehensive presentation. Uh, indeed, it was a, it was a, a comprehensive one uh, that was done interchangeably. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, it put us in a much more better position to, to understand where you come from. Uh, just one question from my side. Uh, the, the constitutionality of the current of the current uh, uh, act, uh, which was uh, in 1978, uh, given the given the, the 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 development, even in the in the uh, technology technological area itself, uh, the the new constitution. Which put more emphasis on 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 on, on rights, particularly socio-economic rights uh, orientation. Uh, like an example, the 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 latest outcome of the court of the Concord case, which rendered uh, uh, some of the aspect of the current act uh, unconstitutional. Uh, but as it pertains to to the reproduction. For the, for the, uh, what is your view in regard to that? <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Chair. We have noted the decision, and of course, um, as a company, it's very important to us that um, works are accessible to all people of all abilities. Um, we have not prepared a formal statement specifically on that, so we would like to revert to you in writing if that is acceptable to the panel. No, that, that, that is acceptable, that is acceptable. Uh, really just, just one aspect, most of the universities uh, uh, on, uh, broadly support, supported the exceptions particularly for, 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 for academic purposes. Uh, what, is, what, what, what is your view in regard, to, in regard to, to the overwhelming support of universities in relation to the two, 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 two bills, particularly the copyright amendment bill? Sorry, Honorable Chair, can you please clarify the question? I think I missed it. 
I'm, I'm saying that the coalition of universities, of South African universities, today earlier on made a presentation, uh, particularly within the exception that uh, applies to the academic, the, the, the accessibility of, uh, of, of, of reading materials to, 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 to their constitu constituencies. Uh, would you have an issue with the uh, with the, uh, <clears throat> with the support that universities are offering to the two bills uh, uh, in view of the fact that uh, it, 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 it makes things much more easier for them to access uh, reading materials, uh, particularly in terms of reproduction. Thank you, Chairperson. I must admit that I was so busy preparing for um, to speak to you this afternoon that I did not um, attend that presentation, um, even though it was open on my computer. Um, I understand your question to relate to fair use for academic purposes. Yes. Um, yes. yes, we do not um, have a, a, a specific position on that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you would like us to delve deeper into that, we can definitely come back to you. Um, we do believe in, in accessibility, as I mentioned before. Okay. No, 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 nothing. Thank you. Uh, you can, can come back to us in writing. There's no problem. Uh, I just wanted to get a sense from, 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 uh, from uh, 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 yourself in relation to the fair use as it pertains to. Uh, acad ac academic academic uh, use of uh, of the material, but let me then take this opportunity on behalf of the select committee to indeed express a word of uh, gratitude to to the team uh, for the effort that you put in uh, trying to help us. Uh, how you how you you structured your presentation, the details the details provided, uh, it made it much more easier for us to to be able to follow where you come from, the risk involved, the challenges around the, those four areas that you, have, uh, that you have put so much emphasis on. Uh, indeed, also proposing concrete mechanisms uh, to, to alleviate the, the, the conundrum in which we are. Uh, so uh, have a wonderful afternoon uh, uh, as we continue uh, with our work. <laughs> Last word from you. Then from the team. Just a very deep thank you for your time, for your openness, and we hope to continue to learn from you and to work with you as we move forward to create strong rights for creators and performers in South Africa. And Absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We're so grateful that we were able to share our thoughts and we look forward to working with you in the future to protect South African creators and performers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, thanks. Uh, as we move forward with the next presentation, uh, the next presentation will be uh, uh, from the National Association of Broadcasters. Uh, which will be done uh, by Ms. Julia Sean uh, Gould and also Ms. Nadia uh, Bubulia, Executive Director of National Association of Broadcasters. The floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, honorable members of parliament and honorable chairperson. We delight to be here this afternoon. I know this is the tail end of a very long day, so we will try yes, to be as brief yes, as we yes, possibly yes. can. Yes. Um, I'm delighted. It's um, been a very long, it's been a very long day. <laughs> yes, to be joined by our legal and regulatory affairs um, head, who's Julia Sham Guild. And of course, I'm the executive director. Um, honorable chairperson, you are very well aware that the NAB has been part of these processes right at the onset. We've made submissions throughout every leg of this process. Um, I'm sure that we can get our slide deck up. And what we'll do is we'll go off camera just to save bandwidth um, and we'll just go straight into our slide presentation.
Thank you so much. So just a quick introduction. Um, we are a voluntary association. We were formed as far back as 1993. We represent all tiers of broadcasters, so commercial, public, and community, as well as signal providers and industry associates. Uh, we're funded fully by our members. Uh, we're a consensus-driven organization, and we also established the BCCSA in 1993. Honorable members, you may be aware that, of course, the BCCSA is provided for in the ECA in terms of Section 54, where there can be a self-regulatory mechanism, which is certainly recognized by ICASA. Uh, we've been at the forefront of representing the broadcasting industry on policy and regulatory matters, right at the introduction of independent regulation for broadcasters through the former IVA and, of course, now ICASA. Our current members, as I said, include uh, television broadcasters, so all of the SABC broad, uh, services of radio and television. Um, we have licensed private commercial radio broadcasters, all the licensed commercial television, television broadcasters, over 40 community radio broadcasters, one community TV. Um, we also represent the signal distributors, Centec, Orbicom, as well as Globecast and Telemedia. And our associated members include the Association of Christian Media, the MDDA, NAMISA, um, and Arena Holdings. The next two slides, you can go ahead, are just a snapshot of the logos you may be familiar with. These are part of the membership base of the NAB. Um, members, I know that you are you're fully, fully aware of the fact that broadcasters invest significantly in the creative industries and provide a distribution platform for content, of course. Broadcasters definitely have a vested interest, uh, interest in a stable copyright legislative framework, one that is conducive to investment in industry and in South Africa. We just want to remind you of the kind of investment and commitment by the broadcasting industry. If you looked at ICASA's very recent state of the ICT sector report, they've actually very clearly demonstrated the investment in terms of local production, which has increased. Of course, this is a, a seven-year review that they looked at, but there's been an increase of 18.7% from what was 12.1 billion um, to 14.4 billion in 2021. So this is just a snapshot of the kind of real investment and commitment that this industry has. Of course, we've heard other presenters talk about co-productions, about partnerships and collaboration. That, of course, makes for a robust uh, industry and for continued investment. South Africa is not an island. We're part of a, the global economy as well. Um, our product uh, has legs globally, and we're incredibly proud of the outputs of South African creatives. Um, so in terms of the commentary on the bills, and I'm going to hand over to Julia shortly, um, just to remind colleagues that the NAB has participated throughout this legislative process. Um, we provide detailed written input at every stage. Um, in our previous submissions, um, we've raised issues which other submissions have also done around the constitutionality issues and whether if passed in its current form, these bills will, you know, past constitutional muster. Of course, the state president himself pointed out uh, quite a few issues of, of great concern in that regard. As members uh, have heard from other stakeholders, we are concerned with the wide discretionary powers afforded to the minister. We believe there's a need for adequate consultation on the implications of vari for various sectors. And you've heard this, as I said, throughout the day. There are flaws in the Copyright Amendment Bill that really needs to be addressed. This has been an ongoing process for some years. Uh, we are also of the view that the Performance Protection Amendment Bill provides important protections uh, to, to performers in the country, and we think that can be delinked from the Copyright Amendment Bill. We think the duplication in the Copyright Amendment Bill and the Performance Protection Amendment Bill should be removed, and the focus really should be on finalizing the Performance Protection Amendment Bill. Um, we think that should be a priority in this process. Um, well, I'm going to hand over to Julia now to just deal with um, some of the key issues, but just to say the legislative process so far, the implications of the bills, as you know, are enormous. They require thorough informed analysis. Uh, copyright legislation is specialist technical area. Um, technical committees, we understand, were uh, formed in the past. There were experts who were appointed. Um, and we understand that they, they they did assist the committee in, in understanding these 
technical considerations. Uh, we think they should be reconstituted to provide support um, in this process. Uh, we also think that subject matter experts are experts we should be drawing on. Um, you would have heard other stakeholders talk about the need for a thorough socioeconomic modeling exercise. We're hopeful that certainly through the uh, provincial process, there is some real input and robust engagement in terms of the impact in terms of provinces, and that impact on rural will be Honourable members go to the heart and core of our cultural industries, they go to the heart and core of socio-economic development in the provinces and of course largely across government. Um, we're going to deal now very specifically with issues that we raise in our submissions and Julia will just give you a summary high level overview in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much Nadia, thank you honourable members. Um, our, our submission was very detailed, so I'll go through our submissions very quickly on, on the specific sections. If you do have any queries, please raise those at the end and we will be happy to address those. Um, in terms of section one of the Copyright Bill, the amendment of broad, uh, the definition of broadcast has been amended to align with the de definition of broadcast proposed in the Performers Bill. While the aim of the alignment between these two bills is to mitigate potential confusion between these two pieces of legislation, the proposed amendment to the definition of broadcast in both bills is inconsistent with the definition set out in, in the ECA, which is the primary legislation for all broadcasting matters. The draft white paper um, is likely to amend the definition of broadcast in the ECA to expand it to include other services which go beyond the traditional broadcasting operators. Uh, this will have consequences on the licensing regulation, payments of license fees, and the use of radio frequency spectrum. While the definition of broadcast must, in due course, be expanded to cater for new technologies and the entry of different types of content providers, the proposed amendments to the definition of broadcast in these bills is vague and could create uncertainty for the creative sectors. Given that the term broadcast is used throughout the bills, the impact on these other sections is unclear, and the use of the amended definition in its current form could lead to interpretation problems. Uh, the NAB submits that until the draft white paper process has been finalized and the necessary legislative amendments have been effected, the current definition of broadcast as set out in the Copyright Act of 1978 should be retained. Um, in respect to the amendments to section 6, 7, 8 and 9 of the Copyright Bill, um, these Amendments to these sections provide for the inclusion of communicating or making a work available to the public by wire or wireless means. Um, we note that wire and wireless are not defined in the Copyright Bill. Um, however, the memorandum on the objects of the Copyright Amendment Bill does provide for the dis distribution of a sound recording to the public by wire or wireless means, including internet access. The lack of de definition of the terms wire and wireless could lead to confusion and interpretation issues. Um, and we also note that internet access is not specifically referred to in these sections. Um, this could result in interpretational issues for the creative industries um, and for users of the copyrighted work. Um, this is especially concerning um, given that there are financial obligations in these sections um, and, and we uh, submit that um, these um, sections should be considered in further detail. Um, Section 8 of the Copyright Bill provides for performers to share in royalties received by the copyright owner of an audiovisual work. Um, while the NAB fully supports um, the increased protection of performers, um, these provisions allowing a performer to share in royalties or equi equitable re remuneration are already provided for in the Performance Protection Bill. Um, and it is not ideal for the provisions to be duplicated in both bills as this may cause confusion. The provisions in the Copyright Bill are restrictive to only one form of payment, namely royalties, um, whereas in the Performance Protection Bill, um, there is great flexibility, and this bill is aligned with the language used in the Beijing Treaty, which makes reference to both royalties and equitable remuneration. In addition, Section 8 also, Section 8A also lays uh, out owner's registration and reporting requirements um, in terms of which broadcasters with multiple channels who have millions of performances, performances will need to register and report each of those performances. Um, this has already been addressed between parties on a contractual basis when content is produced, um, and this results in duplication of, of administ administrative tasks. 
Um, this burdensome requirement could also have a stifling effect on all role players in the value chain. Furthermore, the penalties for failing to register or for even omitting to submit a report are extremely excessive. Um, and it's unclear why such onerous penalties are needed for failing to fulfill what is essentially uh, administrative requirements. Um, the NAB submits that the section should be removed in its entirety, um, particularly in light of the fact that these concerns are already addressed in the Performers um, Protection Amendment Bill. Um, in terms of Section 211C of the Copyright Amendment Bill, um, the, the Select Committee will note that prior to the proposed amendment, Section 21 of the Copyright Act allowed a party who commissioned a work to be owner of the, copy, uh, the copyright in the work. Um, in terms of the Copyright Amendment Bill, the proposed amendment will, will allow ownership of any copyright sus subsisting in a work to be governed by written agreement between the parties. Um, this written agreement could uh, limit ownership of a copyright in the work so that the exclusive right to do or to utilize any of the acts will be limited for the purpose of that commission. Um, the inclusion of this requirement to enter into an agreement for a commissioned work and the potential limitations thereof could create confusion for parties. Uh, the, the NAB therefore submits that the proposed amendment to section 21 um, be um, removed and that the, the existing section 21 be retained. Uh, the proposed amendments to section 39, which relate to the minister's powers to make uh, regulations, will provide the minister with broad powers to prescribe compulsory and standard contractual terms that must be included in agreements between parties, as well as broad powers to, to prescribe royalty rates. These amendments provide the minister uh, with powers that are potentially overboard and that will interfere in parties' freedom to contract. Um, uh, these powers were also likely to be found unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court. Um, the minister will effective, effectively be involved in the drafting of the contracts for the parties, um, which could result in parties being unlikely to enter into agreements if they are unable to independently negotiate contractual terms or royalty rates, um, resulting in negative implications for all creators in the value chain as well as for investment into South Africa and for the economy as a whole. Um, the NAB submits that the proposed ministerial powers are excessively wide, vague, and unfettered, and are likely to be struck down as unconstitutional, and as such should be deleted from the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, in terms of Section uh, 39B, um, relating to unenforceable contractual terms, the NAB submits that this section is overly broad and should either be re removed in its entirety or reframed for clarity so as to ensure that there are no negative consequences for creators in the value chain. Uh, as we turn to the Performance Protection Amendment Bill, uh, we reiterate that this bill should be delinked from, from the Copyright Amendment Bill and should be finalized as soon as possible subject to, to some of the following amendments. Um, in terms of section one of the bill, which relates to definitions, um, as mentioned, um, in terms of broadcasting, until the draft white paper process has been finalized, um, the current definition of broadcast in the Performance Protection Act of 1967 should be retained. Um, the NAB notes that the definition of producer is vague, uh, vague and should be reframed to ensure that there is clarity for the creative industry. Um, the definition of performer in the Performance Protection Amendment Bill is broad, um, and a distinction should be made between performer for the purposes of the statutory rights and obligations and incidental particip participants such as extras who would not be considered a performer. Um, this distinction between these two is especially crucial as only performers have statutory rights to receive royalties or equitable remunerations, whereas extras do not. Um, the proposed broad definition of performer could result in disputes in interpretations of the section, leaving parties with no choice but to approach the courts to interpret the section. This will be costly and slow for all concerned, um, and particularly for performers who may not necessarily have, have the means to do so. For the purposes of legal certainty in South Africa, it therefore makes sense for the legislation to expressly provide guidance in terms of, in terms of this definition. Um, the NAB therefore recommends amending the definition 
of Performa to exclude extras, ancillary participants, and incidental participants. Uh, in terms of Section 51A of the Performance Protection Amendment Bill, which relates to registration and reporting, um, the proposed re uh, registration and reporting obligations in the section are extremely onerous and are simply not practical um, for most broadcasters, particularly given um, that if a broadcaster has multiple channels with millions of performances, it would have to reg register and report each one of these performances. Um, contracts between these parties um, already ensure that there is due compensation for performers and this extremely burdensome requirement may have a stifling effect on creators in the value chain, which could lead to a decrease in broadcast content, resulting in a significant decline in investment in the sector as a whole. Um, the NAB supports the principles that performers must receive equitable remuneration in respect of their works. Um, and the NAB has proposed in submission amended wording requiring that an annual report of usage of the works be made available within a reasonable time after a request from a relevant party. Um, section 51B uh, regarding failure to, to register a report. Um, in this respect, the NAB submits that the penalties in Section 51 uh, are excessive and the registration and reporting duties are extremely burdensome. Um, the section could have a stifling effect on the creative industries as a whole. Um, it is therefore submitted that the proposed se uh, section prescribing the amount of the fine be redrafted to rather to defer to uh, the determination of the fine by the Copyright tri Tribunal with each case being assessed on case-by-case -case basis on its own merits, um, and that the fine should be proportionate to the severity of the act, uh, which is being penalized, um, to a maximum cap of 100,000 rand. Um, as previously mentioned, Section 8D provides um, the ministers with powers to, to make regulations. Um, uh, we, we have discussed this briefly in terms of the Copyright Amendment Bill, um, but in respect to the Performance Protection Amendment Bill, the minister is provided with powers to enact regulations prescribing compulsory and standard contractual terms that must be included in a performance agreement. Um, the section provides the minister with overly broad powers that will restrict a party's freedom to contract. The current proposed wording may mean the minister uh, must prescribe the content of the compulsory and standard terms. Um, in this respect, um, the section will result in parties being unlikely to enter into contracts um, as they cannot negotiate independent contractual terms, which will have a negative impact on creators in the value chain as a whole. Uh, the ministerial powers proposed are excessively wide, vague, and unfettered, and are liable to be struck down as unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court. The NAB therefore submits that the role of the minister should be to guide on some of the specific terms to be included in these agreements, such as the rights and obligations of the parties, the royalties and equitable remunerable, uh, remuneration payable to, to parties, the method of payment to the parties, as well as appropriate dispute resolution mechanisms. Thank you, Julia. So, honourable members, just to conclude, um, we really are hopeful that you are going to consider this, the concerns that we've raised and all other stakeholders today. Uh, certain portions of the Copyright Amendment Bill require significant consideration. Um, we are hopeful as well that um, these key concerns will be properly assessed. Um, and that the select committee is, is, you know, we really encourage you to to look holistically at the at the bills. Um, that wholesale revision and redrafting of the copyright amendment bill is required, uh, we, as we've said before. Delinking the performance protection amendment bill from the copyright amendment bill process will ensure clarity for members of the creative industry. Uh, we think the successful adoption of a viable copyright amendment bill and performance protection uh, amendment bill is fundamentally important to broadcasters and indeed the whole value chain and to the sustainability and success of the creative industry as a whole. Uh, Chairperson, we will stop there, and we really want to thank you again for your time and for the opportunity for the NAB to just highlight um, its, its, its key submissions as already contained in our detailed written submission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julia, uh, and the team for presentation.
Uh, we we are now at a point where we need to to just assess uh, whether there's any clarity seeking question from honorable members. Uh, but we, 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 we were able to, to grasp the gist of, the, of your presentation uh, uh, on behalf of the National Association of Broadcasters. Uh, you you uh, uh, had a view in terms of uh, the, the uh, emphasis on the protection of, uh, of the performers uh, uh, and uh, the need to delink uh, 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 the PPB from uh, the CAB uh, because uh, uh, you raise an issue around the the uh, duplication uh, of performance protection in both the two bills. Uh, but we also uh, captured your, your submission on the definition of, of broadcast and the uh, and concrete proposal in terms of how do we go around uh, this uh, definition uh, in, the, in the two bills, but really as it, as, as, as it pertains to how it is captured in the electoral, Electronic uh, Communications Act, uh, uh, particularly in view of section, section, section one that deals with definition, but also your submission in relation to, to the inclusion of communicating or making the work available to, to the public by wire or wireless, which is captured in in section six, seven, eight, and nine, uh, you had uh, your own issues uh, around uh, the royalties uh, in section eight A. You have made submissions, uh, but also the uh, <clears throat> the issues that you raises around uh, the around section uh, twenty one, and also the. Uh, the minister's past captured in section 39. Uh, we are of the view that you have correctly uh, raised them to, to us. And uh, the, the enforceability or the unenforceability of, uh, of the contractual terms, you are quite categorical in that. So uh, maybe let me then take this opportunity to, to again. Uh, 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 extend a word of uh, thank you to you for the uh, for the uh, manner in which you responded to 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 our to our invite. I have correctly pointed out that you have been an integral part of this process right from the beginning, and and the journey continues. Uh, let's continue to interact with a view to ensure that uh, at the end of the day there is a a point of convergence that will. Uh, that, 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 that will meet all the expectations from, from all the players. Uh, and on that note, uh, again, uh, allow me uh, on behalf of the select committee to uh, uh, express a word of gratitude uh, in terms of uh, uh, your, 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 your appearance before us. It has helped us a, quite a great deal, uh, particularly in relation to the contested views that are the contending views that are that 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 that, that, that I imagine uh, in terms of uh, uh, these two bills. So, uh, Ms. Julia, uh, Ms. Nadia, uh, thank you again. Thank you very much, and thank thanks you. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Grace, let's continue where. Are we? Now, uh, at uh, Creative Commons South Africa, Creative Commons South Africa, uh, which will be led by uh, Bridget and uh, Karen and Catherine Kyo, Catherine Kyo and Bridget Vezina. Are they on the podium? 
Yes, we are, Chair. Oh, the floor is yours then. <laughs> Chairperson and select committee members, thank you for granting Creative Commons South Africa the opportunity to present today. My name is Catherine Curie, and together with Paul West, we head up the South African chapter of this global organization committed to enabling open access, open education, open culture, um, inter alia, working within copyright. We are delighted to introduce Brigitte Vezine, who is the Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons. She is a copyright lawyer with two decades of experience in the field of international copyright law, including 10 years working as a legal officer at the World Intellectual Property Organization, WAPO, where she facilitated the international negotiations <coughs> between member states on traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions as part of the Intergovernmental Committee. Over to you, Bridget, Brigitte, and she will share a video. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll take a few moments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We are with you, Brigitte. Perfect. So I will share my screen. Uh, if you indulge me the few seconds, we need to set this up. So, um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, honorable chair and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor for me to be presenting to you today. I think that the Copyright Amendment Bill is an extremely important legislative process and I want to take this opportunity to commend the efforts of the South African Chapter of Creative Commons for the extraordinary expertise and energy expended to stand up for the public interest throughout this process and for inviting Creative Commons to these important hearings. Um, it's really galvanizing to see a CC South Africa trailblazing these efforts to push for real reform that will guarantee everyone the fundamental rights of access to culture and knowledge. So at Creative Commons, we have a strong focus on copyright law with a view to bringing down the barriers to universal access to knowledge and culture. Creative Commons strives to ensure that clear and strong copyright protections, uh, sorry, copyright exceptions and limitations such as fair use are in place to support unfettered access and better sharing of knowledge and culture, where better sharing means that sharing is inclusive, just, and equitable so that everyone has a wide opportunity to access content, contribute their own creativity, and receive recognition and rewards for their contributions where sharing is reciprocal to rebalance the skewed world we live in, in which a few produce and profit from the works that the many consume, and sharing that is sustainable and where open participation in the public commons is the default rather than the exception. So the bill, through the flexible fair use provisions and exceptions for libraries and archives and education and academic activities, will enable the creation and sharing of material through open licenses to increase resources for teaching and learning. This is a positive step towards increasing access to knowledge and educational resources, especially for researchers, educators, school children, and students, as well as the broader public. A few words about Creative Commons, our organization. It was founded in 2001, and is today a leading global nonprofit organization that helps overcome legal obstacles to better sharing of knowledge and creativity to address the world's most pressing challenges. We are the steward of the widely used Creative Commons license suite for open content, and we're dedicated to building a globally accessible public commons, which is a body of creative content to which the public has access and that it can share use, reuse, and build upon. CC is what puts open into open access, open education, open science, open culture, open data, and the list goes on. In doing so, Creative Commons aims to create a more equitable, accessible, collaborative, and innovative world. Our mission is to empower individuals and communities around the world by equipping them with technical, legal, and policy solutions 
to enable sharing of knowledge and culture in the public interest. And we can count on an extensive network of open advocates on all continents, some of them organized in one of our 46 local chapters, such as the South African chapter. So at Creative Commons, we support a no permission required space to innovate and create. Our licenses and our tools are the global standard to open up content shared online. Our tools are free, they are easy to use, and they're standardized, and they enable creators to share their content with everyone worldwide on the conditions that they determine. Our licenses are built on top of the copyright system. They make use of the existing law to catch up with the on online environment's enhanced sharing possibilities. It's important to note that open does not mean just free. It means that the resources are accessible with irrevocable permission for the public to use them. So why do we, uh, what are some of the benefits to open access, education and science? For researchers, it means greater visibility and much wider dissemination of research across geographic uh, location, across language uh, groups and across academic fields. For funders, it's a better return on investment. For the scientific community and the general public, it means democratization of knowledge by ensuring research is available to everyone. And this, in turn, stimulates knowledge creation and sharing, encourages innovation by building upon shared content, and inhibits the spread of dis and misinformation by making information available to all instead of hidden behind paywalls. And the COVID crisis has shown that sharing research is the best way to do research. So why do we need open? We know that it's hard to change knowledge sharing models, but we need change. We need to reform if we want to solve the world's most pressing challenges, such as climate change or pandemics. We need to do so if we want to have an equitable modern model of contributing to and sharing scientific knowledge in which everyone can participate. And we need this change to ensure publicly funded knowledge is a public good accessible to all. So CC licenses are one of the fundamental mechanisms for UNESCO member states and South Africa joined in 1994 to implement the provisions of the 2019 UNESCO recommendation on open educational resources and the UNESCO 2021 recommendation on open science, where open access is recognized as a core tool to fulfill the human right of access to education and science, respectively. So you may recall that access to knowledge is a basic human right enshrined in 19, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that Article 26 guarantees the right to education for all. And further, to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, a collection of 17 interlinked global goals designed to be a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future, every individual must acquire the sustainable development knowledge, the global citizenship values, and the 21st century skills that are critical to tackling our shared challenges and to promoting a future of equitable, inclusive, and resilient societies. If we want to realize the SDGs, we need the knowledge about them to be free and open for everyone. Turning to uh, the bill at hand, we are pleased that open licenses are mentioned a number of times in the bill and that section three, uh, 39B paragraph two in particular safeguards open licenses and voluntary dedications of a work to the public domain, such as through the CC public domain dedication tool CC0. We are also supportive of section 19C, which men mentions that authors can deposit their manuscript versions of articles in institutional repositories if they are publicly funded 50% or more without authorization. 
At least authors' articles can become open access, even if they cannot publish in open access journals that require hard article processing charges. Furthermore, we must stress that the inalienable royalties as set out in sections 6A, 7A, 8A, and 9A are normal in many jurisdictions and are necessary to ensure greater access to scholarly research. But while the CC legal tools advance global sharing, they do not establish a general sharing framework for everyone. Approaches using CC legal tools go a long way, but they can never fully substitute for suitable laws. In reality, if we look at the cultural sector, only 1% of the world's cultural heritage institutions share their collections openly due to many diverse barriers. And as a consequence, many people are still facing tremendous challenges in the digital environment in accessing and sharing and reusing the content held in those institutions, despite growing use of CC legal tools as global standards for sharing. So policy reform is needed to fill any gaps that are left by an open licensing patch to a universal multi-dimensional problem. So central to Creative Commons copyright policy agenda is making sure that the public's concerns and their needs are treated on equal footing with those of right holders. CC works to shape a system that is balanced and fair for all. So alongside the protections afforded to creators in their creative works, the copyright system must uphold fundamental rights and strong user rights and enable everyone to contribute to building a rich, robust, vibrant and thriving public domain, which is our treasure trove of creative works and knowledge that is available for all to use, that inspires us all and upon which all creativity depends. And to ensure that everyone can enjoy their fundamental rights, clear exceptions and limitations to copyright must be in place as stated by the United Nations Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, Farida Shahid, in her 2014 report on copyright policy and the right to science and culture, Shahid examines copyright law and policy and emphasizes both the need for protection of authorship and for expanding opportunities for participation in cultural life. So in addition to encouraging the use of open licenses, such as those offered by Creative Commons, the Special Rapporteur proposes to expand copyright exceptions and limitations to empower new creativity, to enhance rewards to authors, to increase educational opportunities, to preserve space for non-commercial culture, and to promote inclusion and access to cultural works. And this is why this week Creative Commons is taking part in the 43rd session of the World Intellectual Property Organization Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights and is supporting the proposal by the African group to urgently develop an international legal instrument with clear rules allowing exceptions and limitations in the public interest. In South Africa's copyright amendment bill, there is nothing untoward in having the proposed exceptions and limitations. In fact, the bill is a prodigious step in the right direction to reach the balance necessary to foster opportunities for the creation and sharing of culture and knowledge online. I must note that it's also becoming increasingly frequent to have both detailed exceptions and an open-ended provision, sometimes called open norms, such as fair use. In its recent paper entitled The Global Har Harmonization of User Rights Approaches Toward an International Instrument, the Creative Commons Copyright Platform Working Group on User Rights concluded that user rights or exceptions and limitations including systems of fair use and fair dealing, systems of statutory exceptions and limitations and hybrid systems are fundamental to freedom of expression and information. The group found that a hybrid approach, which combines the open-endedness of fair use with statutory exceptions and limitation is possible. 
and that the countries that adopt this hybrid approach may use both fair use or fair dealing, as well as additional specific exceptions and limitations, such as exceptions for libraries, archives, and museum, for purposes of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Several countries of common law tradition have codified more specific exceptions and limitations in their copyright acts, in addition to fair use or fair dealing, while courts in some civil law countries have considered uses beyond those statutorily established as legal, as long as they fulfill certain criteria. So to conclude, honorable chairman and distinguished members of the committee, Creative Commons confirms its general support for the Copyright Amendment Bill. It's a complex but progressive piece of legislation that is bound to propel South Africa into the digital age and beyond. If passed, it will serve to improve access to knowledge and facilitate the use and sharing of teaching, research, and learning materials. It will enable access to persons with disabilities in alternative formats. It will enhance the services of libraries, archives, museums, and galleries, and it will enable temporary copies to be made and interoperability through exceptions for computer programs. So speaking in favor of creativity, innovation, and better sharing of knowledge and culture, Creative Commons believes that the new exceptions and limitations, including fair use, but also set out in 12b, 12d, 19c, and 19d, are in accord with international copyright law and with practice in multiple jurisdictions. They are absolutely necessary to ensure fairness, inclusion, and diversity in South African society and to drive a new era of economic, cultural, and social development in South Africa. So Creative Commons strongly urges you, distinguished members of the committee, to support the inclusion of exceptions and limitations and uphold the public domain in South African copyright law. South Africans deserve copyright rules that allow them to, fu to fully embrace the opportunities offered by digital technologies to enjoy their fundamental rights. No one should be burdened by having to abide by out of touch, one-sided and unfair copyright rules. A biased copyright system favoring large industry interests guided solely by profit can only lead to the erection of more barriers, potentially slowing South Africa's economic, social, and cultural development. With these final words, Creative Commons invites you to seize this unprecedented opportunity to propel South African copyright law into the digital age and enable South African citizens to enjoy their fundamental rights to education, cultural participation, freedom of expression, and access to knowledge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Brigitte, Christina, uh, for that uh, presentation in terms of uh, uh, expressing your views in support of the of the open uh, of the openness as propagated by the by the Copyright Amendment Bill. Let's check uh, with, the, with the honorable members. I think Vezina was quite clear why the need uh, for, for equitable, inclusive, and uh, uh, a robust, uh, robust uh, uh, regime. Uh, access to knowledge, that's what came across. Uh, promotion of right to education uh, and uh, uh, quite clear in terms of uh, the need to make sure that uh, uh, we promote we 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 the there is there is a reform that speaks to the current the current set of uh, uh, intellectual property uh, laws that are biased uh, against. Uh, 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 the vulnerable. I think that is the sense that is emerging from from you, from you, Vasina. Uh, 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 it looks like uh, members of the select committee are quite are quite are quite comfortable uh, with the with, 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 with the explanation and also how you ran with the presentation. 
and uh, it will definitely help us as we engage with the with the, with the two bills moving forward. Uh, uh, and as a result thereof, uh, maybe I must just take this opportunity on behalf of the state community to again express a word of gratitude to you uh, for honoring our invite uh, to help us uh, in uh, formulating a position on this on this uh, on this uh, two birds. But we are quite clear that uh, it is important that uh, uh, the <coughs> there is a need for reforms uh, in terms of. Uh, what we currently have, uh, in view of the new, the new, the new uh, development that is unfolding across the across the globe. Uh, any last word from your side? <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was an honor for me to address this body. Thank you, thank you, Vazina. Uh, then, uh, on that note, have a wonderful, have a wonderful afternoon, uh, Vazina, and your team. Uh, can we get assistance from Grace? How far are we now? Uh, uh, Chair, Chair yes, that, uh, that is, that is the, the last presenter of the day. Um, we tried to get, um, we tried to see if we could get Recreate to maybe come back. Um, the organization that missed this session this morning. Um, we've been trying to get them back to come in, but um, as of now, they haven't been able to confirm with us. So um, they did say that if that happens, then we must just consider the, um, the written submission. Oh, brilliant. So uh, we essentially be done for the day. For the day. So uh, when are we reconverging again? Okay, today. today okay, okay, thanks, Chair. Um, today concludes the public hearings. Um, we were going to have a meeting on the 28th of March um, to hear. Um, um, to receive a briefing from our parliamentary legal advisor on the implications of the constitutional court judgment, as well as um, the, the department was going to brief the committee on responses on to the issues raised during the public hearings. But unfortunately, the parliamentary program has changed. Firstly, there's a joint chairperson's workshop happening on the 27th and 28th, and there's also an NCOP sitting um, on the 28th as well in the afternoon, and we've been informed that um, committees have been asked to, to shift their dates um, in order to accommodate that plenary. So we will then move um, the deport back session from the DTIC back to its original date on the 16th of April, Chief. Okay. No, thank, thank, thank you for that update, Maria. Let me then, uh, on that note, to, uh, take this opportunity to, to indeed thank uh, the members of the Select committee for being so so focused uh, throughout the whole day, uh, but more than that, our our our, our guests that uh, uh, took time to prepare for this uh, public hearing. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, it became uh, in handy in terms of uh, also giving us uh, a different. Uh, understanding and also uh, raising key key issues uh, that will help us in terms of our deliberation uh, the uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, uh, youtube channel but also the uh, uh, two committee secretaries and uh, the assistant and uh, uh, the researcher and the and the content advisor uh, that was great uh, and have a wonderful uh, uh, evening uh, until we meet in April. Thank you. Recording stopped.